I see kind of the full spectrum of prostate cancer patients from those that are, you know, worried about having prostate cancer to guys with metastatic castrate resistant disease. But I think the future is pretty bright for more things coming out in that space. And then those liquid biopsy and genomic profiling will really help us identify these patients that can benefit from that pathway. So I'd say in the earlier localized settings, I really only do it when there's a strong family history or, or someone has a family history of a known mutation or something like that already. But in more advanced setting metastatic disease where cure may be harder to come by and you know you're going to be looking at, you know, using a bunch of different therapies down the road, that's when I tend to do it. And I would say in first line metastatic castrate sensitive disease, while we already have very well approved, you know, first line therapies, it may not change much of what you're going to do, but the information I think is going to be helpful as we move forward. And this becomes a bigger part of the field. You know, you can only imagine if you're doing a biopsy over and over again, that's going to become pretty invasive and burdensome to the patient. And it is something you may want to do because every time you change a therapy or you add on a new therapy, that kind of changes the genomic landscape of the tumor. In prostate cancer, there's not often a need clinically to do a lot of biopsying of metastatic sites because you can often tell by we have PSA which gives you a sense and in metastatic patients that's often very high already so if you see metastatic disease you often don't need to just sample as long as you got a diagnosis of something in the prostate therefore having a liquid biopsy tool that can tell us what's going on now in that patient is very critical because we don't really do that many tissue biopsies as much in prostate cancer and often the prostate biopsy which is the initial diagnosis may have been done years and years and while you can still get information from that in terms of a, just a processing standpoint the information may not be relevant because the tumors changed a lot since then in prostate cancer advanced prostate cancer we've been seeing a a huge amount of new drugs that have been coming to the market, which is great because decades ago we had limited number of them. And now it's almost a question of which one do you use and more trials that are actually coming down the market that are actually combining a lot of these drugs. And sometimes that's going to have increased toxicity, especially when you're bringing in a chemotherapy. And there's still a lot of unanswered questions as to does everybody need an intensified uh, regimen? Are some able to benefit from a less adverse regimen and still get a good, you know, efficacy? Uh, and we don't know that based on the clinical trials we've been doing, you know, because we lump everyone together. The profiling will give us that precision medicine to kind of tell us who needs intensification, who maybe doesn't. And for sure, it's going to open up, you know, a lot more doors in terms of just biomarker driven medications that are actually targeting pathways that the genomic profile alludes us to existing that can actually be targeted to. And, and while we have new agents that have just come out in that space in terms of the PARP, PARP inhibitors, I, I think that's just a very beginning of a very uh, explosive area. We're seeing a lot more therapeutic options for prostate cancer. And while prostate cancer, I think, has typically been considered a cold tumor from an immunotherapy standpoint, I think we're seeing a lot more research uh, and investigation into immunotherapies and prostate cancer. And so that's an opportunity, I think, where we are going to see more of these biomarker driven pathways and, and more pathways that we're going to learn about and, and that have biomarkers that tell us that these therapies will work because it's targeting a pathway in the actual tumor. One of the things we definitely see is that this gives us an option to do immunotherapy where normally we would go towards a, a taxane based chemotherapy and that's going to have a lot more side effects and many patients the idea of going into chemo is something that they're not you know, necessarily looking forward to or wanting to do and if there's an option that they could do aside from that then they'll take it and so would we and this allows us to provide that option and, and I, as i mentioned before i think while we have two therapies currently in this park inhibitor space this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see a lot more coming down and genomic profiling will be the gatekeeper to getting these patients into the door for those therapies. It's not often that we're doing tissue biopsies and the prostate tissue, which is often what's sent is usually years, years old, and it may not apply to the tumor you're treating today. This is an area that's new for urologists, but very exciting. And while I think we're just seeing the beginnings of it, and while it may seem very daunting, you know, because it's a space that most medical oncologists and, and colleagues have been doing for a long time, I think we should embrace it like anything that's new. I think we're going to find a lot of benefit in learning for ourselves and for our patients. And I think we'll, we'll find it bring a lot more innovation to what we do. 
One that comes to mind is a patient that you presented with metastatic disease and we put him on androgen deprivation therapy and a novel hormonal therapy. But in time, he eventually progressed to castrate resistance. We switched his hormonal therapy. We talked about chemo at that place, but he just really, he had a strong family uh, history of cancer and had a lot of relatives, including his parents that have gone through chemo. So he just had some very negative perceptions of what that may even be like for him and, and was just dead set against it. Uh, and that's why we put him on the novel hormonal therapy after he went to a castrate resistant space. And when we tested his actual prostate, we didn't really see anything. And then down the road, we, we did liquid biopsies just because we know that this you know, mutation may have changed. And we actually saw an actionable mutation from there that gave him an option that he could try outside of chemotherapy. But this allowed his, us to continue treating his prostate cancer in a way that we thought would be efficacious for him. And at the same time, meeting his goals of, of trying to avoid chemo when possible.